Heavenly Father, thank you for this time we can spend together to preview the lesson for next week. There are so many things happening today in our church. We pray especially for the Balinao family as they've decided to remove the respirator off Brother Balinao. We may the peace that you promised that will sustain us in times like this be real, especially real in the lives of the Balina family to the ministry of your spirit. Use us in whatever way you deem necessary for us to bring comfort, somehow consolation to them even at this difficult time in their lives. Be with the planning for the church this coming year. Uh, thank you for the inspiration we had for the second service today. May we seek to follow your guidelines that will revive us as a church to truly make a difference for you. Be with us now as we study the lesson. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so real quickly, uh, we talk about relationships this morning. And I had no time to cover this because this relationship is seven. Okay, the, the reason why I was able to remember this is I have a weird acronym. The acronym is Afof my, okay, it's it's kind of it's kind of it's kind of I couldn't come up with something uh, something that's gonna be meaningful. But the fourth my, you're saving. You go through seven levels of relationships, okay, to to really be close to someone, and this holds true for God, this holds true for your family, this holds true for fellow church members, and for your friends. And the deeper you go into these levels, the closer the relationship would be. Okay, let me just run down what these levels are. The first is acquaintance. Acquaintance is just tongue in cheek, you know. Have a good day. How are you doing today? You know, that's very surface level. It's acquaintance. You, 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 you're, you know, if you've been in Facebook, there's acquaintance. <laughs> Close friends. You know, all sorts of categories. But acquaintance is somebody... Who's not a stranger? He just met, it's a very surface level. You know, the, the, the very casual greetings, that's acquaintance. And now then you go progress into facts. You start sitting over lunch and talk about, will uh, Romney beat Obama? You know, you start talking about facts. Oh, there's a problem with the uh, business dealings of Romney. And then you start, you know, you start looking into this thing. Have you read what CNN just posted? CNN just posted uh, a possible financial scandal that Mitt Romney was engaged in before he ran for president. And then you start sharing the facts. Or you start sharing the facts. What did the WBO judges uh, say about the Pacquiao-Bradley game? Okay, so you start looking at all the facts. That's the second level. Then after you've laid the facts, the third level is giving your opinion and your judgment. Oh, really? Bradley should have surrendered the belt. She should have not claim that. Is there really hope for Romney? Oh, even the evangelicals are losing their confidence in Romney. You start processing this. You, you, you don't do that at an acquaintance level. You just say, hey, how you doing? You know, Let's have lunch. Oh, see you, man. I uh, had a good time. Facts, you talk about facts. Opinions you start sharing, and sometimes you'll have difference of opinions. You get to the level, you start getting into that person somehow deeper than the way you did it for the first two levels. Now, it is possible that when you start sharing your opinions and your judgments, that you will be insensitive to the feelings of the other person. So sometimes you say, I don't care as long as I'm right, <laughs> who cares about you? You know, you know, and you're only up to here. You're only up to here in terms of your relationships. The moment you have gone to the fourth level, you don't, you don't just drop your opinion and your judgment. You start considering the feelings of somebody else you're related to. Okay, now you, you, you become extra careful, right? You just don't blurt out whatever's in your head, okay, because of this. And then it becomes more challenging. If you want to be really close and intimate, you start admitting you make a mistake. <laughs> you know, for you to go to somebody and just tell that somebody I made a boo-boo, <laughs> you, know, you got to be close to that individual. You, know? you don't want to humiliate yourself to other people. But you can be comfortable in admitting, man, I just blew it again. You know, I, I tried doing this. 
Well, you know, you only say that to a friend, right? Then after you admit a mistake, a deeper level goes into accountability. You tell your friend, man, I fail in these areas. Would you be kind enough to check me? So I'll be accountable to God and accountable to you. Would you be kind enough to pray for me? You know, I, I, I will be honest with you and I'll admit, I will admit my mistakes. You process my mistakes, but in the same token, Please make me accountable so I'll know how to straighten out my mistakes and my failures. You're getting really deep here. And then by the time you get to the seventh level, you start, you start talking about your fears and your dreams and your plans for the future. And like I said so many times, there are very, very few people who are allowed by you to enter this zone that's almost a very very private zone I will not tell you exactly what's in my head if I'm not that close to you about my fears and my dreams and my plans um, and I always say this sometimes it's difficult to get to this level even to your wife even to your kids even to your family the goodness of the Bible is God's always there uh, one part of the homily that I put together during the wedding of Jamie was I said keep Jesus as the center and I said note I did not say make Jesus the center <laughs> because he is already at the center you don't make him be in a position where he's not already there keep him there whether you like it or not Jesus is at the center but he will not force you and whether you like it or not, whether you share your fears and dreams to God, whether you pray, if you follow the suggestion of Pastor Cordero this morning and you spend time as a family in His Word and be vulnerable to God, whether you do that or not, God knows, right? You cannot pull His leg. How much more effective it would be if you are willing to go down all the way to this level in your relationship with God. And when you do that, you will be amazed. Uh, I was, I was, uh, I was really, I was really uh, I was really thrilled when I was listening to Pastor Cordero uh, give all the illustrations of Philippine culture and American culture and the distinction between Filipinos and Americans, how we should relate in the family. Because while he was saying this, I had this in mind, okay? And Dr. John Paul and the author of our quarterly does not lay claim to this. It didn't come from him. It, the, it came from Dick Durson. Uh, the, I think he works for the, the health systems in Florida, in Orlando Hospital. But this is something you want to follow, you know, sustaining relationships. First, you want to apply this in your relationship to God. You want to have a close relationship to God and be sure that you will be there when He comes in His kingdom. Make sure you go all the way to the seventh level, which is intimacy. Are you intimate with God? And you want to be close to a friend? You want to be close to your spouse, close to your kids? Easy. It's easy. You know, ask God to enable you to go to these levels. Uh, if, if your kids really share this feeling, their feelings with you, where are you at? You're right here. You got a lot of levels to work on. And if it, find, it becomes very difficult, you got to pray and allow God to push the relationship deeper. What you want to do is really go into intimacy with them. So that when that happens, uh, you know that there's an expression among our kids. They're tight, you know. You know what tight means, right? They're tight. You got to be tight to do that. Um, all of this, if you notice, has, uh, been, uh, has been covered by Paul in his letter to the Thessalonians, right? We covered that. Talks about accountability, talks about their fear, talks about his joys over them, and he talks about visiting them, you know. I, I really like that translation in Filipino 
masidhing pagnanais, intense longing. You know, it's not just a longing. I intensely long. I want to be there. You know, I, I was. I, I I can only express this. The first time I met Lourdes and company, and I haven't seen them. I only saw them for that the one night when we had the Bible study. I wanted to go back and study the Bible with them again. And when they knew we were coming, we were Facebooking each other, and they saying, "Man, we could hardly wait to see you." You know, that longing of being together. And, um, and people, people uh, wonder why, you know, how, how long will Lourdes be here? Oh, she's leaving Monday morning, so she flies in Friday. She just spends the weekend here. She does not normally spend three weeks in America. She takes a break every year to spend two weeks. But because of Jamie's wedding, she came over here. So I said, I was telling Lourdes, you don't have to show up. Just be a sponsor in absentia. And she tells me, I can't do that to you because I had to go back twice for the wedding of her son. Why did she come over? Where do you think am I in my relationship with Lourdes as a friend? Right here. How many of you listened to her testimony? Tim would put that in the archive. Long before she had the guts to say all and spill the beans in terms of what happened to her in her married life. She spilled the beans. We talked over that and she told me everything that happened to her. You don't tell that to anybody <laughs> until you come to a point where you are at this level. And little wonder when I go back to the Philippines, it's, you know, I, I don't have all the credentials you have, but man, oh man. One phone call from Lourdes. Lourdes is going to be there because she's a friend. Hope we can say the same thing to our family members and our fellow church members and a lot of people you want to be close to. You got to nurture those relationships. The relationships make the difference. Um, what does Jesus say? By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. And that goes here. I just want to warn you. By nature, we're not loving, right? I, you can try to pull my leg and fool me, but I'm telling you by nature, you want to get back at that guy. You know, if, he, if you're one step ahead of me, I've got to be one up on you. I'll do something to be ahead of you. That's your nature. That's why it is impossible to do this. What makes it possible? It will only make it possible if you allow God to do it through you. I'll give you an example. You don't know how much I prayed over the weekend, <laughs> last weekend. Uh, I, I just, the, the sweltering heat, getting the flowers, preparing for the wedding, preparing for all the guests, going back and forth to the airport, doing all sorts of stuff. I said, how much longer can I sustain this, Lord? You know, one o'clock in the morning, wedding was early in the morning. We were still doing something. You know, Lord, how can this happen? You know, how, how can I entertain the guests? How will all this work? You know, the, the, the limo was pulled over by a cop. On the, Jamie was crying inside the, the limo because... And the cop was milking it, just spending 10 minutes. You know, that's why the wedding was late. All sorts of things happened. But in the morning, I prayed hard. And Lord, I said, you know, I'm glad that my daughter is finally getting married. But this is not for her only. This is for you. There's so many guests. I'd like you to show your glory to everybody. And, and give us the joy of making people see you. And there you were us. And, Lourdes finally flew the following day. The dog got sick, you know, the Roslyn's dog for the hearing impaired. Spent a ton of money, almost three grand just to... Because this is a special dog. If the alarm sounds and Roslyn cannot hear it, the dog has to warn her. Just like a seeing eye dog, this is for the hearing impaired. So she was rushing back and forth. She made, hardly made it to the reception. Then she finally left for San Francisco and before they left for the Philippines. They texted us and Lourdes tells us in the text, he said, uh, Pastor Bing, I've never been in a place where there was so much love. And Roslyn, you know, you know Roslyn, like, like the only thing I learned during the weekend, aside from above all powers, was, he said, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Let me do that. And Roslyn kept on saying, no, 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 no. Thank you. She, she never felt so at home in a church setting for the first time she attended the church setting here. You always, in the Manila, our Bible studies in a restaurant setting. <laughs> it's not the church setting. You know, you know, they eat there. 
But here for the first time, they were in a worship service and she couldn't believe how meaningful a worship service would be, despite the fact that she couldn't hear what was going on. And I said, Lord, man, you're so good. You're so good. You just took over. I saw you. I saw you move in Macau. I saw you raise your, your, your glory to everybody and called people to you. You touched lives. And I saw you touch lives again over the weekend. You know, remembering that allows me to go through this. You think I would care less about that guy who cuts me on the highway? <laughs> I could care less about what he does for me. I am so happy with what the Lord has done that overpowers all my human tendencies here and I bask in the grace of God and that grace enables you to go through this intimate steps in relationships so you cannot do this by moralizing you know I, I cannot tell you you gotta understand feelings you know you gotta admit your mistakes who among you find it natural to admit, admit your mistakes come on who admit your, your all we call it in the Philippines amor propio right we care about ourselves. We care about self-pride. God says, God what? Exalts the humble. So, what do you do when you do this? I'll, I'll share this with you before we go to the lesson this afternoon. I had no time this morning during the lesson study. I was talking to Annie. You know, Annie and Bob just came back. How's your dad? Oh, my dad's undergoing chemo and radiation. And, you know, anybody who's gone through that, you know, how difficult it is. You know, Adrian describes it in his own words. That when the moment you go undergo chemo, it's almost like feeling death flowing to your body. Yeah, that's, that's how bad it is. So, so people ask the question, why does, allow God, God, why does God allow us to go through this crisis experience, this difficult experience? Why, why allow the Balino family to go through this experience right now with... You know, releasing, taking off the respirator, releasing your dad, and dying. Why, why does God do that when, in fact, when we get to heaven, there will be no more death? What's the point in having us suffer here? You know, people, that's why they don't want to believe in God, because we suffer here too much. You know, I look and look, and I tried to think about this all week, and there was one answer I gave. God will not tell you, I allowed you to go through a difficult experience in your life so that when you get to heaven, you can have the strength to go to a difficult experience because there's no more difficult experience in heaven. Then why should I go there? It's senseless, Lord. You tell God the senseless. No, it is not the difficulty that God's after. It is your willingness to trust Him during those times. I can imagine God walking with you in heaven when you get to heaven and said, Remember the time you lost your dad? Look at him. He's walking with us now. He'll never go. Because you trusted me. Look, we have eternity to celebrate together. What God is after is that you trust him. Learn to trust him because only those people who've completely trusted God will enjoy eternity with him. That's what God does. It's not a matter of proving who's the strongest among us. It's a matter of proving how willing you are to trust God. That's why our prayer every day would be what? Lord, help me to trust you some more. It may be a more difficult day today. It may be an yes, exhilarating day. But you got to pray to God, Lord, help me trust you some more. Because you're my God. And when he comes back and gives you that heavenly home, there's no problem. You trusted him. You trusted him in adversity. You will trust him. Just the ages of eternity where there will be no more death, there will be prosperity, there will be health forever. So all of them hinges on the steps. I hope you do not forget this. A uh, quick way to remember, I told you, is a FOFMAI. <laughs> for, for lack of a better acronym, I just call it FOFMAI. I'm, uh, I'm having some Alzheimer's. I have Alzheimer attacks once in a while. I have a problem with short memory. Okay? The only problem, because I have a problem with short memory, I cannot remember my long-term memory. <laughs> but every so often, about after five minutes, I can remember, but it takes a while before it gets there. So what helps me, especially when I'm putting together a study, are acronyms like this. So when I wrote this, it's still fresh in my mind. I read this from Cleos, uh, Cleos the Nation, from John Polen. About three weeks ago, I read this from his, uh, his writings. Oh, this is cool, I said. How do I remember this? A fourth my, a fourth my. So I wrote the fourth my right there. Those are the steps that you need to follow. This works for your friends. This works for your family. And above all, this works for your relationship with God. Okay? 
Now we will go to we will go to our study in Thessalonians. Okay, remember I, I told you this morning that uh, somehow there is a close affinity with the Greece with the Greeks uh, and Thessalonica. Who was the greatest Greek general? You mentioned Alexander the Great. Okay. Give me the greatest of the Greek philosophers. You learned this, okay? The first, Socrates is the first greatest. Who next, who next to Plato? After Plato was Aristotle. So everybody thinks that there are only three great Greek philosophers. Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Who is the fourth philosopher? There is a fourth philosopher in Greece that a lot of people do not know. Okay, so... Plato was a student of Socrates. He was a disciple of Socrates. Aristotle was the disciple of Plato. Who was the disciple of Aristotle? Alexander, Alexander the Great. So Alexander is so known for the prowess in his military campaigns, but they never take into consideration that Alexander is a philosopher. And I tell you what, and I'll, I'll describe this to you very quickly. Um, Remember uh, who, what was the kingdom before, uh, before Greece? Remember the image? There was Babylon, there was Medo Persia, and the Cyrus, Darius, you know, Artaxerxes, those guys are the great generals, the great generals defending, defending Persia. And then, if, if you know, if, if you remember the, if you remember the, the military campaign of Alexander the Great, they were outnumbered by the Persians. The brilliant Alexander didn't fight the front line. He went straight to the commander <laughs> with the sword. That's why it was a very swift conquest. That's why Alexander died a very young man. What was his, what was his frustration? There are no more worlds to conquer. That's just saying. When the Greeks won the battle against Medo-Persia, they wanted Greece to dominate the world empire, okay? And what was the philosophy of the Greeks? The philosophy of the Greeks is that the Greeks was a superior race to any other race in the world. Everybody else are barbarians. The Greeks are the cultured people of the world. Hellenism, okay? The glory that was Greece. Um, so, because you got barbarians and Greeks, what kind of world did they have? Were the people united? No. There was a certain class here, another class here. Alexander the Great was a universalist. He conquered the world not just for the conquest of Greece. He wanted all people to be one. Whether you're from India, you're from the Middle East, or from Greece, from Europe, from Asia Minor, it doesn't matter. All of you must be one. Okay? It's amazing, huh? You read Paul's writing, what does Paul say? There is no Jew or Gentile, male or female, there is no slave or free. Everyone is one in Jesus Christ. That, you notice how God prepared the minds of the culture to the gospel pre proclamation of the apostles. Okay? So what was the, what was the, 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 the region called when Alexander did this domination? Macedonia. Okay, Philip of Macedon. That's the father of Alexander the Great. So he conquered Macedonia. And Paul went to Macedonia first, okay? En route to his gospel proclamation of Europe. And you know what, what happened? He actually went to Philippi. We studied that Duke in the second missionary journey. He went to Philippi. Where did you get the word, the, the name Philippi? What's the name of uh, uh, Alexander's father? Philip of Macedon. That's why it's Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi, it was named after Philip, okay, who actually had the reign of Caesar. And then one of the four generals of Alexander, you remember the four generals? Seleucus, Ptolemy, Lysimachus, and Cassander. Cassander eventually married the daughter of Philip of Macedon, who happens to be the half-sister of Alexander the Great. When Alexander died, he turned over that region to Cassander. And that wife, okay, chose to live 
in Termas. Termas was the original name of Thessalonica. And Thessalonica became Thessalonica because of Cassander's marriage to the half-sister of Alexander the Great. I hope you're getting the connection. And God put all of this together so that when Paul was connecting with the Thessalonians, Paul was basically saying, I want the world to be united because it's a divided world. Okay. If you have your quarter list and you read your quarter list, there was a cult during the time of Paul. What was the name of the cult? This is the name of the cult. The cult of Kabirus. It was grounded on the name men called Kabirus because Kabirus taught that all men should be equal. Okay? Similar to what Alexander did. But the Greek philosopher who was more refined, more sophisticated than everybody else knows said, we are more superior than other men. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you right now, have you checked lately the statistics in the, in the Philippines uh, in terms of the distribution of wealth? Uh, how, how, what's the percentage of the Philippine population who are poor and the percentage who are rich? So my friend from the office asked, how is it, how's it in the Philippines? Because you go to the Philippines every year. Is, is, is it similar to America where you have a lot of the middle class? You know, the middle class is in the middle. So there's not a whole lot of discrepancies between the poor and the rich. I just read a, a street uh, philosophy of Philippine history, and it has remained 70 to 30. 70% 70 of the populations are poor, 30% are free. Uh, it, it is actually worse than the other stats I heard. It's 80-20. They said that... Uh, 20% of the Philippine population eight, owns 80% of the resources of the Philippines. And 80% owns 20% of the resources. And that's true for every nation. That's true for every country. This guy said, I don't want that to happen. Everybody should be equal. Everybody should have the same dignity. Maybe you may have a different income. But nobody should say, hey, I'm rich, then I'm going to look down on you. I'm more sophisticated, more cultured than you. I will look down on you. Kabiru said, no, everybody must be equal. But the problem was Kabiru died. And when Kabiru died, there were a lot of legends that said that Kabiru came back to life. And he performed some miracles and he helped a lot of people who were in need. Okay? Then several years passed, something was introduced in Rome, and it's called the cult of the emperor. What's the meaning of this? Why is it called the cult of the emperor? Because the emperors, the Caesars, became gods. Okay? Remember in study of, in study of Revelation, uh, the guy who threw John into the boiling pot of oil, um, said, I don't, I don't want to wait until I die to be God. I want to be God right now. Okay? So he proclaimed himself to be God. So there is the cult of the emperor. They're saying, no, Kabirus is not the God that we're looking for. Actually, Kabirus came back in the form of the emperor of Rome. Are you following? Since he came back in the form of the emperor of Rome, then we must then worship the emperor. That's the cult. There's a problem. How does the emperor treat the citizens of the empire? Did the Roman citizen have the same privileges as the ordinary citizen? No. You had very different privileges if you're a Roman citizen. So the teaching of Kabiros was gone. Follow me then. If you're from Thessalonica and you were longing for Kabiros to come back, and the Caesar takes over what Kabirus is saying, you will then live an empty, an empty life. Why? Because you will try as much as you can to find that equality, but you will never find it. Because the ruler of the empire saying, the Romans are more sophisticated and higher than any other culture in the world. So what was the feeling of the Thessalonians? 
They were empty. You know, I'll try, I'll try, I'll try my best. And, you, know, you don't realize this because you're in America, and Pastor Cordero kind of alluded to that this morning. But I, I, I've seen a lot of my friends in the Philippines, they try as much as they can. They go to school. They try to look for jobs. They cannot land jobs. You know, if, if you want to be a cashier at the McDonald's in the Philippines, you will need to have a four-year four college degree just to be a cashier. And you know what kind of money you gonna earn doing that? So you try your level best and then people, people say, why in the world do people want to go to the United States and migrate to another country? Because it's empty there. I try to do my best to advance in the Philippines. I can't. So the frustration of emptiness and what else? Because there's an emptiness, there's a restlessness among the people. Do you hear what Pastor Cordero said? If you've been to the Philippines lately, you know this? The graph and corruption, which is part of, you know, and then... then uh, we're more we're more insulated here in in the United States, but in the Philippines, people running for office will spend millions upon millions of pesos to buy votes in order to be in office. So if you spend so much money to be in office, what do you do when you're in office? How do you get back that money? So that vicious cycle goes on and on and on. Corruption is part of the culture. And until you find people who have enough money, who don't care about money anymore, both in the military and in the political sector, the chain will never end. This was Thessalonians. People in Thessalonica, it's empty, restless, hopeless. That's why when Paul came, when Paul came to Thessalonica, in just three weeks, how come a lot of people responded to Paul? It's the reason why we're studying the lesson for this coming Sabbath. Because of the background that I just gave you. People were looking for somebody with the philosophy of Kabirus, who will have equality, who will give them hope, who will give them fulfillment, okay? That's hope. We have rain now. We've been dry for so long, okay? Yeah. Of course, you can look at it from another end. Uh, I don't know what's going on in Good Samaritan right now. Maybe the Lord is shedding tears for Brother Belino too. So, um, but you know what I'm trying to say? The Lord prepares the minds of people before the gospel comes. I don't know where you are today. That's why I have no problems in evangelism. I, do, I don't feel any pressure as to how many baptisms, what kind of meetings you will have. All I care about is that, has somebody touched someone in my life? Can I sense that, that someone is hungering for God? If I do, I will share the gospel with them. You know, you know Pastor Kedar had a lot of stories. I can sense from him, he had no time. But there's one story that Greg Laurie just shared. Uh, some people were giving out tracts, you know, they were giving out tracts one day for free in the community. And then so this one boy started knocking on the door. Uh, press the doorbell, nobody responded. Press it again. The boy persisted and eventually after about 10 minutes or so, there was an old lady that opened the door. And welcome the boy, gave him some, something to drink and thank the boy for what's going on. When the series started and the pastor asked for a testimony in those who attended, there was this old lady who stood. So I want to speak. It was that Monday afternoon when the rope was around my neck. And I was about to kick the bench to end it all. And the doorbell rang. I wanted to ignore the doorbell, but the doorbell kept on ringing. And I decided to take off the noose from my neck, come down off the bench and open the door. And I saw this little angel. You don't know who God has touched in your life. The counsel is, do not ever think that you can change the other guy, okay? 
It's not, not your job. That's not my job. I cannot change the person's heart. Only God can do that. And you know what God does? God shakes you. Hey, 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 wake up. And when somebody wakes up ready to listen to you, you know what you do? You'll be ready to share. Uh, I like Greg Laurie's illustration yesterday. Greg Laurie is the Billy Graham counterpart in, the, in L.A. Uh, you know, Madden Hattie Singers. So, so this, uh, he's an avid surfer. And you know what surfers do, right? Go to the beach and uh, wait for the big waves. And then say, Greg says, once in a while, you get this big one. <laughs> and when I say big one, you're going to surf. And unless somebody helps you, you're going to drown. That's a big wave. And it so happened one day, there was a very big wave. And he said, there is no way in the world I can surf this wave. So he went under the water. And he said, the only way I can live is to raise my hand and shout help. What did I tell myself? Oh no, that would be embarrassing. <laughs> My friends will call me a sissy. <laughs> Are you asking for help, you know? You know, you're, you're a surfer, you're asking for help. But I'm dying, you know? So then, oh man, you're, you're a girly man. <laughs> you're not a real man, you're not a real surfer, you're not a real athlete. So he, she was, he was trying to stop himself. Will you do that? No, when it comes to life and death, you say, help me. Oh my, it's, it's very poignant. He said, how many people from the standpoint of spiritual <laughs> catastrophe about to drown? They said, I don't want to raise my head. It's going to be embarrassing. And yet you need help because you're the brink of life and death. That's our calling. When we get there, be ready to actually go and respond to the person who is in need. That's why. Towards the end of Thessalonians. Because there was no hopelessness. What did Paul talk about in 1 Thessalonians 4? What's the theme of 1 Thessalonians 4? What was going on in Thessalonica? Those people who converted to Christianity started becoming persecuted by the Romans, right? And the Jews. When they're persecuted, what do they do? They kill you. Or they throw you to jail. You know, I don't know when I'm going to preach my next Revelation series. But I deferred. I wanted to share that story that I shared with you about the three, uh, the three men in Turkey. You remember that story? There were two Turkish gentlemen who were giving a Bible study and one uh, missionary from Europe. Uh, during their Bible study, there was a, a son of the mayor who joined the Bible study. And they told him, Oh, we are really interested in learning more about Jesus Christ. The two Turks were Muslim converted to Christianity. The other was a Christian missionary, I think, from Germany. The following day, okay, let's go to the printing press, the Christian printing press. So this son of the mayor showed up with four other friends. They went inside the printing press for the Bible study. They shut the door behind them. And after one verse was read, they tied the two Turks and the missionary to a chair. In the next three hours, they systematically tortured those three and recorded everything in their cell phones. One person was stabbed over 150 times, the other was 99 times. And the stabbing, I mean, if you've got strong guts, you can go to YouTube and you can see this. They started lacerating their bodies. It was so bad, they saying they went like this. It's almost like the head was literally just hanging. And this was all videotaped in a cell phone. And um, when they had the funeral, the entire church was there. The wife of the missionary with three young kids said, uh, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And the Christian journalist said, she did in that one prayer what we've been attempting to do for the last thousand years in Turkey. It touched a lot of lives. So that was the state of the Christians. They were not only losing their jobs, they were being thrown in jail. Aside from being thrown in jail, they were fed to the lions. They were literally being killed. Uh, you know, do you think this is really far from our country? How many of you have heard of what has happened in Arizona? Have you heard that story? 
about this guy who started the house church. Uh, he started the small Bible study in his home. People started coming and the, the Bible study grew. So he built an, a, a detached garage and converted the garage into a, some sort of a chapel. They started meeting there. He's now in jail. Because according to the Arizona village, at least the village where he's in, that uh, there was a code violation. Because there's a code violation, it's a safety hazard in the community. Therefore, you got to put a stop to this meeting of people because parking and all the start, you know. There's a difference in gathering for a football game or a baseball game every week, you know. Where does this end? First Amendment of the Constitution says you have the right to worship, right? To worship God freely. So fine, forget the, forget the church. But there is a freedom of assembly and a freedom of worship. Where does it end? 10 people? 20 people? 30 people? So this has gone viral. It's gone all over the world. But what will you do when the village of Instel and the village of Bird say, if you meet in the church, we will pick you up one at a time and I'll throw you into jail. What will you do? And that will happen one of these days. By the way, you know, if, if you're banking on your house and your personal property as your hope for the future, you will be of all men miserable, most miserable. But like my, one of the teachers in Macau told us while we were having dinner, you know, one of the teachers said, all of my belongings is in one suitcase. And I can go anywhere I want. That's it. Ravi Sakarai was saying, he, I was having a meeting in India. And people were sitting on mats because there were no chairs. And all the belongings of each person was in that mat. Kind of hard, right? When the persecution comes, oh my, my car, my car, my house, you know, my bank account. You start thinking about this. I'm not saying it's wrong to have those, okay? But you got to have a balance. If you, if you bank on those guys, when the real tribulation comes, you'll be a more, all, all men hopeless. Unless you want to take the other side. But that's what happened to the Thessalonians. It's happening. And what did Paul tell them? Don't worry, your friends and your relatives who died, even if they died, what will happen to them? We will not go ahead of them. Paul believed that Jesus will be coming during this time. He was basically saying in 1 Thessalonians 4, we will not go ahead of them. But you know what? They will rise first. The dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive will be caught up together with them in the air. And we will be with the Lord forever. That's what he said in 1 Thessalonians 4. So I, I, I was talking to Annie after church today. And I was talking to Lilibet. I'm talking about Brother Balina. I'm talking about the father of Annie. You know, it's very hard to find joy in your hearts when these things are happening. But man, we do not weep without peace because... We know this is not the end, right? God has promised. Uh, remember those two missionaries? They came from China. They went to San Francisco, got off the boat. Still no planes then. I think there was a, I forgot who the president was of the United States. Then they realized that the president of the United States was with them in that boat. And when the, when the President of the United States uh, disembarked from the boat, there was a red carpet. There was a limo waiting for a president. And everybody was giving them all the fanfare and the welcome. And the missionary was shaking his head. The wife said, what's wrong, honey? said, for years, for so many years, we lived in China. And here we are. Nobody even knew that we we're coming home. So he struggled with this. And then later during the night, the wife asked the husband again, have you talked to the Lord about it? Have you found any consolation from him? He had any word for you? Yes, I'm good with it now. You know what the Lord told him? My son, you are not home yet. You are not home yet. Um, uh, I'm looking at the, the event over the weekend and 
you know, it will be easy to marry sons. <laughs> it's easier to marry sons than marry a daughter. There's a very big challenge when you marry a daughter here in the United States. Even Lourdes was saying, man, it's very difficult to marry in the United States, all right? <laughs> yeah, it's a big challenge, I said. You got to put up with a lot of preparations and all that kind of stuff. I don't know because I couldn't read my manuscript during the wedding homily. If I said this, I said, although I'm very excited that Jamie and Joe would like to have seven kids, I'm not excited about babysitting those seven kids. I was not more excited, that was, I wasn't more excited than when I saw Jamie bring the picture of a girl home. She has adopted a World Vision girl from the Philippines which she regularly supports. I missed that because I couldn't read it. I didn't have reading glasses. I had driving glasses and the mic wasn't working. So I couldn't move, I couldn't see my... So my, my, my thing was I said, although I want seven kids and grandkids from you, I'd love to see those grandkids. I'd love to see more World Vision kids from you. I'd love to see Jonah just fixing the church and all the problems of the infrastructure of the church. I love to see Joe building a Christian home built on the promises of God. That was my prayer, long prayer, Sunday morning. So may it not be all of the fanfare and the pomp and circumstance of the wedding. May it be about you, Lord, and use this wedding as a reflection of your glory. It, it's, it's a balance that we need to maintain. Uh, because we will study that in Second Thessalonians, and I'm going to end there. There was a problem with the Thessalonians. When they heard about Jesus Christ coming back, what did the Thessalonians do? They stopped working. They went house to house and ate the food of their fellow members. And then Paul said, you have a problem. <laughs> and you read the Thessalonians, he who does not work should not eat. He said that, that's as simple as that. You don't become a freeloader, you don't want to be a freeloader. So what am I trying to say? The big tension, and I think Mourinho knows this, there's, 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 there's this, working and waiting for Jesus, okay? Don't forget, two W's, working and waiting. This is the balance that you need to draw. Work for Jesus as if he will not come back for another thousand years. Did you hear me? But wait for Jesus as if he were coming back tomorrow. Let's repeat that, okay? Very few words, like Dr. Caesar said. <laughs> it's very loaded. How do you balance First and Second Thessalonians? Just saying, you got some issues, you got so many crisis experience in your life, that will end when Jesus comes back. So wait for Jesus so earnestly and intensely wait for Him as if He will come back tomorrow. But work for Him as if He will not come back a thousand years from now. That's why when they asked Martin Luther, he said, if Jesus were to come tomorrow, what will you do? What did Martin Luther answer? I will be planting an apple tree. Now my heart is in Jesus Christ. If he comes tomorrow, I'm ready for him. But as long as he hasn't come, I'm going to tend my garden and I'll do my responsibilities. That's what he's trying to do. So the tension in the church remains. How do you work for Jesus and how do you wait for him? I hope we set that straight. Uh, Thessalonians will be something that will be worth treasuring. I told you Chuck Swindoll was asked the question, if you were to share with a friend of yours what, kind, what book in the Bible you should first read, you know, as a young Christian, what would that bi bi Bible book be? What book in the Bible would you recommend for a young Christian? Yeah. Of course, during the Sabbath school everybody said John, John 3.16, that's the most loved. So, Jack Wendell said, yeah, for years I recommended John. But the, for the last couple of years, I changed my recommendation. I recommend that they read 1 Thessalonians. Because in Thessalonians is a group of people who just heard the gospel in three weeks. And yet the, the, in three weeks, they were longing for Jesus to come back. And what were the three principles? I'll repeat it with you as we end. What are the three principles that covers 1st and 2nd Thessalonians? Those are three short verses in the Bible, easy to remember. 1st Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. The first is rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. That's why I love it in Tagalog, everything is M. Magpakagalak, manalangin, 
at magpasalamat. Yeah, but in rejoice evermore. In other words, is it possible to rejoice? That doesn't mean you laugh yourself away until you drop dead. That's what it means. It means even in the toughest of times, you will have the consolation that you will have here. Uh, and, and I was sharing this with Annie. I said, you know, after, after everything is said and done, remember my dad was undergoing dialysis for five years. I wake up early in the morning. I take my mom to the dialysis center. I take my dad. My mom watches my dad till nine o'clock. I pick her up at night. That happened every day for five years. And it wasn't easy. Why did I have to go through that? The reason why I had to go through that was because God wanted me to be very intimate with him. Remember this? In fact, it was really weird. After burying my dad, you know, we had the service here in church. I'm kind of glad that kind of my mom was relieved too and he was no longer in pain. But I missed something. I got to confess this to you. I missed the kind of prayer I have with God when my dad was still sick. You follow me? There is a certain level of intimacy in your prayer when you're going through a tough time in your life. That doesn't happen every day. That's why God, every once in a while, gives you an experience in life so that He pushes you to the seventh level. I don't want just your feelings and your mistakes and your confessions. I want you to come to me and be very, very intimate with, with me. And sometimes I need to inflict pain so that you can come to me and actually be very close and be intimate with me. And then what do you do? How do you make that intimacy? Like I said this morning, pray without ceasing. How do you pray without ceasing? The famous author of the book on prayer, E.M. E. Bound, said, Practice the presence of God. And the presence of God can be practiced anywhere at work, when you're doing the dishes, when you're cleaning whatever you want to clean at home. Practice the presence of God. Stay in His presence. And thirdly, regardless of what happened, Praise and thank God anyways. Um, so I'll ask the same question I asked uh, Johnny Carson when he was still alive, as of Sandy Patty. Sandy Patty was guesting in the Johnny Carson show, the Tonight Show. And you know, Johnny Carson was kept on pushing Sandy Patty to curse. Okay? And Sandy doesn't curse. So finally she said, okay, let me create a scenario for you. What do you do when you're driving a nail with a hammer and instead of hitting the nail, you hit your thumb? What do you say? Yeah, and I was, and they're, looking, they're looking at Sandy and Sandy. I just said, Dad! <laughs> Sandy said, I call my dad. Uh, for us Filipinos, your true, true color comes when somebody surprises you. In Tagalog, pag inulat ka, dun lumalabas ang tunay mong kulay. Right? Yes, when, no, what's, when, you know, when, when you, 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 don't know, you don't know I'm around and I, I just, from your back, you know, I jolt you. And something comes out of your mouth, that's what you, Jeff Terry, okay? That's what Jesus is trying to say. And you know, in my prayer every day, Lord, I hope what comes out of my mouth will be you, right? You know, in fact, my prayer is, Lord, if Alzheimer's really sets into my mind, <laughs> I hope when I cannot think and I cannot figure out what I'm saying anymore, whatever I say, I hope it's about you. Mm. One last illustration, just, just, just bear with me. I told you about this, the adopted son of Ronald Reagan, right? Uh, for, for you, and let, indulge me, because I didn't share this with everybody. Ronald Reagan, you know how Ronald Reagan died, right? Died of Alzheimer's? Oh. Before Ronald Reagan had a very, very serious bout with Alzheimer's, his kid visited him in the home. And every day, this kid hugged his dad. The Alzheimer's worsened. And one day they were visiting Ronald Reagan, his adopted son. And then they turned around, they wanted to go to the car. And then the wife said, you forgot something. What do you mean you forgot something? He turns around and there's the picture of Ronald Reagan doing this. He turns around and... Oh, <coughs> Google it and go to YouTube. There's a story in YouTube about the son of Ronald Reagan. The, the funeral eulogy that he gave. You know, when, when you're so used to the intimacy with God, even if you don't, can't think anymore, everything's gone. You will still be hugging him and you'll be embracing him. 
you know, pray that the Spirit enables you every day to look at Jesus and go through this. Okay? Meanwhile, appreciate what Thessalonians can do for you. And I hope that Thessalonians can, can bring you closer to the hope that is only found in Jesus Christ. Don't forget to pray for the Balina family at the same token. Pray for, what's uh, Anis, uh, Ani? Enriquez, the Enriquez family and the Umbao family for the, the undergoing graduation and chemotherapy and the bereavement of the Bellino family. Let's power it in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful this afternoon we can preview the lesson for next week. Oh Lord, this book was written almost 2,000 years ago and we find so much relevance in our lives today. Especially as we live in this end times, there's a very big temptation in America to depend on our own resources, our possessions. May we understand that security is found in Jesus Christ alone. Help us not to be so attached to this world. You will need to pry our hands open for us to let go. Instead, show us how precious you've been to us through Jesus Christ, that we will find our surety and certainty only in him, regardless of what happens. Jesus will always be with us, even until the end. Bless these teachers and bless these people who have attended this afternoon. May they share the same hope with their class this coming Sabbath as they study more of First and Second Thessalonians. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.